we would learn our lesson from this, whatever that is, whether the lesson as a nation, the lesson as a church, the lesson as an individual believer, the lesson for the unbeliever. What is that lesson that God has? For the unbeliever, it's to be saved. That's for sure. I mean, his is not a hard choice. For the believer, it could, it could roll around. It could be several things. But, don't, but listen, the indwelling Holy Spirit will teach them what it is and for them to get it taken care of. Uh, we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Encourage your hearts through this study, Father, today. Live in the peace of Christ. Amen. Well, our study today uh, comes from Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled, which we picked up out of the Last Supper of John 13, 14. This is our third lesson. And we've, Jesus introduced chapter 14 with the theme of chapter 14 at, at the Last Supper as he prepares to go to the cross the, the, that very day. Uh, and what we were interested in showing, like in verse 1, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. And he gives an antidote. He said, the first thing you have to do when your hearts become troubled, he says, and he puts it in a command. These are, these are two commands. It's in the imperative mood in the Greek. He says, I want you to believe in me. Believe in me. Direct your troubled heart. Whatever your heart is troubled over, direct that problem to me. Direct it to me. I will take care of that for you. I will take care of it for you. Now listen, the troubling of your heart is your issue, but the resolving it is a God issue. And I wanted to be sure that we understood that. And then he, he said, believe in me and, and believe and believe in Jesus said, and believe in me, believe in Christ. Well, that was the antidote to the troubled heart in verse one. Then he goes through a discussion with the disciples about him leaving by way of the cross and they can't come with him at this time and, and he will be back with them and they're not getting it. They're, they're not buying into what he's teaching. They're, they're rejecting what he's telling them. And so in verse 27, something's happened in the, in the troubled heart of the disciples between verse one and 27 of John 14 because the next time he addresses their issue, he says, let not your heart be troubled, nor fearful. Their troubled hearts have now become fearful because they have not been able to get adequate. They reject what he, he this whole time he's giving them spiritual solutions through the word of God, and they're not buying into it. And we talked about why. What were they believing that was contrary to what Jesus was teaching to fix their very problem. And we addressed that in the previous lesson. So I don't want to go back and address it again. For us, though, we're, we're now entering a second month of the COVID virus. And now we have to ask ourselves, has our troubled hearts become fearful? Has our troubled hearts become fearful? Are, are we making decisions out of fear or we make them out of faith? For the believer, you don't make decisions out of fear. They're always wrong. They, they, they have no resolve to them. You always make them out of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And then that has to be cycled through believing, applying, and waiting on God to do what he promised you. That's a principle of the Christian walk by faith, not by sight business of 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And so what we're dealing with in this issue of let not your hearts be troubled. In verse 27, Jesus gave them the answer before he addressed their additional problem. They're panicking. They, they've become fearful. Uh, you can always tell panic. It's a fright and flight. First, it goes in fear. When fear clicks in, at first it goes fright, and then it goes flee. And there's no solution in that. 
it, neither one of those are right. The other F word is fight. It's not flight. It's not. This is not how it's done. No. It's not fright. It's not flight. It's fight. Fight the good fight of faith. This is that 1 Timothy 6.12. You've got to know that. Now, Jesus is dealing with their heart. Their heart was troubled. They didn't resolve that. They didn't listen to his teaching on how to resolve that. He gave them scriptural evidence and solutions. They weren't buying into it. And so now he says, before he addresses their fear, he does what he always did. Every time he met the disciples and their hearts were in fear, he always said peace. If you want a great study, go back and study the word peace in the life of Christ with his disciples. He, he always had to do it. Even after his resurrection, he, he would step into their presence and they, would, they, they, they were in a fearful state. And he would go like peace. And, and listen, it was a doctrinal word to their life. It was a, he could just say peace, and he had already taught the doctrine. He taught that in ver chapter 14, 27. He said, he said, peace, I live with you. I'm going away, but I'm going to leave peace. The peace of God that's been a, a given to me, the peace of God that's been assigned to me to give to you, God's peace has been assigned to me to give to you. And when I leave, the peace doesn't leave with me. The peace stays with you. What a wonderful idea to know about that. And so first he says, peace, I leave with you. Then he says, my peace, the, pe the peace of God that's been given to me to give to you, my peace, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you, give I to you. And then he says, do not let your hearts be troubled, nor, see, that's a double knot. Not nor. Not nor is a double knot. Because they, let their, they, they've troubled their own hearts by rejecting the truth of the word of God to live by categorical doctrine that was pertinent to their problem. He addressed it in 26 verses. Chapter 13 and 14, all the way to 26, he's addressed it. And all his teaching did was produce fear in their hearts. And w w how is that possible? Because they were rejecting everything he was telling them that would resolve it. Go back and study that, by the way. Let not your hearts be troubled, nor let your hearts be fearful. They had allowed their hearts, that's a middle voice, they had permitted, they had allowed themselves to get their heart troubled to a point when they heard the solution they become more troubled because they rejected it. They went into fear. When they went into fear, fright. They went into panic, flight. Now they're running from everything he has to say. They're still in his presence, but they're, you know, little kids, they have a wonderful way of saying, I don't like what you're telling me. They go, la, 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 la. You ever notice that? La, 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 la. Or they might put their hands on their ears. La, 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 la. Say it. I, I'm not buying anything you're saying. Mentally, they were doing that, not physically. Physically, they were sitting there like, I've got it. I, I'm listening to you, and I've got it. I've got it covered. But they didn't because their premise was wrong. You see, if the object of your faith is wrong, then all your decisions that come from it are wrong. And you're going to dig a hole you can't get out of. And the Lord's going to let you dig a hole you can't get out of to show you that you are helpless and needy, and he's there to do it. And like Joseph, he will pick you out of the pit and set you back on your feet and take you places you could have never imagined taking yourself while you were in a pit, where your brothers were on, on top of the pit, figuring out a way to kill you, sell you, and destroy your life. God, God is still in charge. You need to give it to him quickly. Don't wait a day. Don't wait a month. Don't wait a year. Don't wait half a lifetime. Give it to him. Give it to him today. And what's he give you? 
what's the antidote for a troubled and fearful heart? The peace of God that's been given to Christ to give to you. I hope in this lesson today you will get that point because that is the antidote. If you, if you work up yourself, troubled heart, and don't listen to the truth of the Word of God about the situation categorically you're in, don't look at the categorical doctrinal issues of the solution, you're going to go from a troubled heart to fright to flight when the truth of the matter is what God wants you to do is stand and fight. But you haven't got the faith because you got your, you've got faith in the wrong object. Hello, disciple of Christ, all mixed up, permanently set like concrete. Don't be that disciple of Christ. And so we talked about that. We talked about it last Sunday, by the way, because I've moved, remember I moved my Sunday lesson, Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled, to Wednesday. If you want to go back and pick up lesson one and two, and you should if this interests you, so that you can stay up to speed, you have to go to Sunday, Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled. I want to talk about three things today in the short time I have. My lesson today, live in peace. Live in peace. Not receive it, live in it. It comes from Thessalonians. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians and the 5th chapter. I give you a moment with me as I hunt mine out. I went to 2nd. I'm into 1st, the 5th chapter. Now, if you have a study Bible, like, like I do, a Ryrie uh, New American Standard Study Bible, or, or something equivalent to that, type of translation. You will see, if you have a study Bible, you will see that the last section, we're in the last section of the book of 1 Thessalonians from verses 12 to 28. We're in, we call that context. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull a text out of context. Now, when I do that as a pastor, a teacher, a, a teacher of spiritual growth maturity in people's life and not just a pastor of church mechanically, but my supreme goal as a teacher of Doctrinal Studies Bible Church is to take my people from being a baby believer to an immature believer to a mature believer to uh, a, an ultra mature person that we call super grace. That's my goal. I know how to do it, and that's my goal. If people will come and sit down and stay with me a year, I will put, you, I will put your feet under you, spiritually speaking, so that you can walk by faith and not by sight. Now, in what is interesting about verses 12 through 28, what's interesting is, listen to me now, I got it under point number one. There are 17 imperatives. That Those are commands in the Greek language. 17 of them. In other words, when Paul gets ready to close the book on 1 Thessalonians, he gives 17 commands to the Christians at Thessalonica about how they should behave during crisis. It gets 17 commands. Here's what's interesting. 16 of those 17 commands are in the present tense. That's a standing order, a present continuous action order. The last one, which is recorded in verse 26, which is the word greet, is an aorist tense. That's a hut to command, an heiress, a point in time, divorce from time. It's a very strong command. And he wants them to greet, listen to what he says in verse 26, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Now, we certainly can't do that today. We can't even greet each other with a hug because of this virus. We can't greet each other with a handshake. We have to, we have to nod. Uh, give a high five or keep our six feet of social distancing. But this is an air tense. And this air tense says, I want you to greet everybody. I want you to behave yourself with other people. I want you to greet all the brethren. And I want you to do it in the aorist imperative because I want these other 16s to be fundamentally part of the way you conduct yourself as a believer during times of crisis. 16, 16 present imperatives are all rolled up into this one aorist as he closed out the book, 
greet each other with a holy kiss because of these 16 ways you're dealing with people in times of crisis. Now, over the month of April, I'm going to pick five of those out. Uh, five of the 16 I'm going to pick out. And I'm going to talk about what I, why I think they're pertinent to our time uh, during this crisis. And how it will help you to use these, this information as you go through this crisis. Because w if you use them right, that is by faith. Walk by faith, not sight. If you do that properly, you will learn to use these in other crises because they all work in other crises of your life. They, it doesn't have to be a virus. It could be marriage. It could be family. It could be business. It could be health. It could be a lot of different issues. And so I think these are important. Now, I picked the first one I picked. There's the first one that was commanded in a present imperative. Live in peace. That's one word in the Greek language. Uh, I, as one, it's the word peace, but it's in a verbal form, and it's a present middle. I put this down on your, I guess I did somewhere. Yeah, down there. It's a present active imperative, second person plural. He, he tells everybody, I'm going to tell this, everybody in the boat, you're in the same boat. Here's the solution to everybody in the boat. He was at the Last Supper. They were all sitting around the table. He said, I'm going to tell you how this works. We're all in the same boat. The crisis, Christ is going to die. They don't believe it. They didn't join his team for him to die, to be buried and raised from the dead. They did not join his team to do that. They joined his team because they believed he was the Messiah who was going to establish a millennial kingdom. And they're going to believe that even after he's raised from the dead. One of the last questions they ask him pertain to that same thing in Acts, the first chapter, as he was about to ascend back to the Father. It shows you how difficult erroneous thinking can be to get rid of. Well, notice in this passage, you get into verse 13, live in peace with one another. Live in peace. That is all one word, live in peace. Live peace. Live in peace is one word in the Greek language. It's a present active imperative. In context, Paul has 17 commands, but 16 of them are present imperatives, all rolled up into the final command, all rolled up in the way we're supposed to conduct ourselves among each other in crisis time. We're all in the same boat. We're, everybody... Every, every Christian in my church is in the same boat. And every Christian church in Alabama is in the same boat. And every Christian church everywhere in the United States is in the same boat. Every Christian church everywhere in the world is in the same boat. And this doctrine is good for everybody in that boat. And the first one is, Live out the peace of Christ in your life. Live it out. Christ gave it. God gave it to Christ. Christ gave it to you. And you're to live it out. You're to give it out to others. You're to live it within yourself and to give it out to others. I'm giving it to you today. The peace of God that was given to Jesus to give his disciples... was given to me as one of those followers of Christ to give to you. For you to have, to you to live it, to live it, in order for you to live it. It's a coping mechanism. Live in peace. What kind of peace? This is the peace of God that was given to Jesus to give to man, mankind. It can only come to you through the gospel of Christ. You've got to believe he died for your sins. That's a damning sin. And when he died, he dealt with the damning sin and personal sin in the life of a believer. That's 1 John 1, 7. That takes care of verse 9. So it's really important. So what you ought to do as we go, I'm only going to, I've only got a month that I want to devote to this. 
I'm going to deal with five of the 16. It would, it would serve you well to read all 16 because they're coping mechanisms for times of crisis for the second person plural, the congregation of Christ on earth. I don't care where you are. You, you could be anywhere in the world. You're picking us up through the Internet. I, we hear of people from all over the world who listen to us. You need to really listen to me. For this is the antidote to the church. I mean, you've listened well to the medical people tell you how to cope physically. Physically. I'm telling you how to cope spiritually. You could, you could, you could, you could deal with this physically and be miserable spiritually. The disciples were that. The, what is the, what is the object of your faith? If it's not the word of God, and I mean by the word of God, I mean pertinent to what you're worried about. We call that categorical doctrine. What's the Bible say about yada yada? Whatever that is, you've got to research the Bible for that. And that is what you have to apply to your, to your problem. I hope you get that. Now, here's the second thing I want to tell you. All members of the Godhead. That is, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are involved in spiritual peace. Now think about that. Anytime in the Bible that you find all three members of the Godhead, I tell my people this all the time, anytime you find all three members of the Godhead involved in any one single issue, you got a big deal. And, and they're, they're involved a lot together and peace is one of those the word in the Greek Irene what is Irene Irene is the inner inner it, it is inner tranquility of freedom it's the inner tranquility of freedom you know like Galatians 5 1 Christ has come to set you free and then th verse 13 that goes with that. Well, peace is inner, tranqu inner tranquility of spiritual freedom. And what it is, it's the freedom from the stresses and the strains of the surrounding us, surrounding us as a crisis. A crisis is not a bad thing. It is a good thing. It's bad depending on how you deal with it. You see, G listen, all the disciples believe that Jesus going to the cross, going to Jerusalem, being arrested, being tried as a criminal of the state, being put to death by crucifixion, being buried, and on the third day raised from the dead, they, listen, they didn't even buy into the resurrection. Because they couldn't get past dying on a cross. Yet, the whole Passover, at the time he died, the Passover on which he died was shadow Christology of what happened in Exodus with putting the lamb's blood on the wood of the doorpost of the house. The cross that, the cross that was the, of every house in Egypt. If, if it had the blood of the lamb on it, when the death angel, when the death angel rolled over it, they were spared. And if it wasn't, then the firstborn of man and beast died. Why? Nobody listened to the word of God. And those who did, they found peace, they found freedom, and they were rescued. You, we, we, you, you need to understand this. But Pam Asher sent a little note out the other day, posted a, a correct doctrinal principle about peace, having attended our class, Peace of Christ. She mentioned peace is the ability to stay calm in spite 
of the atmosphere of panic. <laughs> nobody can, listen, nobody can put panic in you. You put it in yourself. Nobody can put fear in you. You put it in yourself. You have to change your way you think. You've you, you got to change the way you walk. You're, you're walking by sight, not by faith. Now, here's the way the three members of the Godhead work with peace. God the Father is the origin of, per, of, of, of spiritual peace. God, one of the characteristics of God is, is peace. I call it a secondary for us, but it, it's peace, like grace, peace. It is peace. It is peace. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. 5.23. of 1 Thessalonians. He says, Now be the God of peace himself. Sanctify you entirely. See, this is the second time in, in our passage he mentions peace. He mentioned it in verse 13, and he mentioned it in verse 23. That you're not paying attention, but you should. And, and, and listen, if you got a pencil, you should be writing that down. I tell my people, you might see that as a gate question when you get there. That may not mean, mean anything to you, but it means a lot to my people. I'm speaking to them. Now may the God of peace, as well as you. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you into, may the God of peace. May the God of peace himself, himself, sanctify you entirely, your spirit, your soul, and your body. Isn't that wonderful? So this whole idea, where, where does, what's the origin of the peace that I need in my soul today? God. God. And what did God do? Well, he says, I'm really interested in your, I want to put peace in your spirit, I want to put it in your soul, and I want to put it in your body. When, when you put the, when God puts the peace of Christ, spirit, your soul, and your body. It's not going to affect just one. It's going to affect all of it. Listen to me. The word in that passage was completely. Completely. Spirit, body, and soul. God's wonderful. It's the origin. He's the origin of the system. So what he does is he extends it. He, 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 he's the origin of it, and he gives it to his son. God, his son, he's the salvation source. The way the peace of God gets into a human being, spirit, body, soul, completely, the way it gets there is through the Son. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And not just because he's the Lord Jesus Christ, but because he's the Savior. He's the Savior. He went to the cross in order for you to receive the peace of God, not just in salvation and not just in eternity, but in time, in the way you live in your life, live in peace, in God's peace that's been brought to you. We now call it the peace of Christ, Fun, the, the functioning peace of Christ. You can't have the peace of God apart from the Son, and you can't get it in the Son apart from believing that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. It's called the gospel. It's called the gospel. Listen to what Paul wrote in Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on to explain down in verse 12 that through Adam's sin, death came into the world and death spread to all mankind. Look, the reason we have disease, i.e. virus, the reason we have disease and death which we're talking about every day, multiple times a day. That's all there is on the news, and I understand that. It's about a disease and death. Both of these are due to Adam's original sin. Romans 5, read it. Romans 5, 12 through 21. There was no disease or death in the Garden of Eden until Adam sinned. And we've had it ever since, and we'll have it out through, the human, through human history. Romans 5, 12 through 21, in case, case you're now interested and you need to write it down. Now the Holy Spirit. 
So God gives it to Jesus. Jesus gives it to us. And here's what he does. When he goes back to the Father and sits at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, he sends forth the Holy Spirit. The third member of the Godhead in the absence of God the Father from our life, except as a figure, and Jesus Christ up here. Both of those are in heaven. What is the functional of the function of the peace now is the responsibility of the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit. The third member of the Godhead at the moment of salvation, because we live in the church age of the new covenant, the moment you believe the gospel, the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Your body becomes the temple of God, a mobile church. And the Holy Spirit is there for the functioning of the peace of Christ in your life. The peace of Christ that you got positionally the moment you got saved, you are at peace with God over Adam's sin. The 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin, alienation, uh, blind, spiritually blind, spiritually condemned, uh, spiritually cursed, uh, spiritual darkness, spiritual death, spiritual enmity. The whole list goes on. Look at the 50 things that you can never lose in time. Journey. Read it and study it. It's off our website, doctrinalstudies.com. It's there. Now, the Holy Spirit's been sent there. We have positional truth. We have peace with God through the blood of Christ. We are never going to be charged again for any of, those, of Adam's sin. That deal is over. And what has replaced add all of that is peace. The pe we have peace with God. And we have the peace of God. Through Jesus Christ, he extends that peace to every person that believes the gospel. That peace of God is extended to him in his life. We have it positionally because of the work of Christ on the cross. And when we believe, we get it positionally. But listen we can have it experientially. The peace of Christ is ours exper experientially. Live, it, live, it's a command. You can't, there's no commands with positional truth. The commands are for the Christian way of life. When he says live in peace, we're not talking about positional peace that you got at the moment of salvation. The peace of God, never, never to be charged again with Adam's sin. It, it'll never be brought up ever again in the heart of God. Your name, your name is in the book of life, and that deal is secured. It's anchored. If you don't have the assurance of it, it's because you're not studying the word of God. You're studying the word of man, not the word of God. You notice I keep throwing scripture out at you. Now, what you do with that's your business. But I'm throwing it out there at you because this is what you've got to have. You've got to have assurance based on the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. So God gives us the Holy Spirit and we're to walk in the spirit. When we walk in the spirit, he produces, you know what? When we walk in Galatians 5.16, we walk in the spirit, not the flesh. The mindset on the flesh, carnality, can never please God. But walking in the spirit does. Yeah, that's the point. When you walk in the Spirit, in Galatians 5.16, then you get the fruit of this walking, you get the fruit of walking in the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22, 23. The fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, individually thought of, is one tree that produces nine different types of fruit. Wouldn't we all like to have that if it was good? We have it in the Holy Spirit's work. Love, joy. You got it. Love, joy. Peace. Who's producing that in you? Who's producing the peace of Christ in you? It is the Holy Spirit who come not to witness of himself. He came to witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the functional part of this peace. That's a missing link today. In your troubled heart, you should confess that troubled heart because that troubled heart has put the object of his faith in something that's not relevant to the crisis you're in. 
You need to pull out the Word of God categorically, take a look at it, and apply that to your problem. Now you're walking by faith, not by sight. In the meantime, you need to look to the Holy Spirit. He teaches and recalls the Word of God, John 14, 26. And that is a key to your life. Walk in the Spirit. How, how, how can I live in the... How can I live in the peace of Christ? By walking in the Spirit. That's a choice I make. It's a command situation. This is what I do. I walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, not the power of the flesh. I don't make my own choices. I, I lean upon the Word of God, for I am rescued. What God has promised, he is, he is able, and He is willing to complete. He's able to perform it. That's Romans 4.21. Romans 4.21. So, listen. I find this interesting. If you have your Bibles, and I'm about, to, I'm about to have to close this thing down, go to Philippians a moment. I'll show you something really interesting. Back this thing up here. Colossians. Philippians. It's on your paper once you get your paper. But here's the fourth chapter. Uh... I'm going to read 6 and 7. I'm just going to pick up a couple. Watch this now. Here's, here's, here's what's relevant to your troubled heart. That if you don't fix it, and you can, listen, you can easily, you can be, the way you begin the process of fixing a troubled heart is go to the Holy Spirit because troubled heart is evidence of flesh. Flesh is carnality. It's evidence of carnality. Go back to the Holy Spirit. Shut that Shut it down. Shut that troubled heart down by looking at the divine solution. And f listen, for one thing, it's the peace of Christ. Are you saved? Do you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead? Do you believe that? If you believe it, you're saved. If you're saved, you have the peace of Christ in you. Now, get it, it's, but it's not functional. Why? Because you're walking in the flesh. You've got to walk in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, instantaneous, supernaturally, the peace of Christ can be produced in you and through you. Dear hearts, you've got to listen to this stuff. We live in the church age of the new covenant, in the great ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing. That probably drives English teachers crazy. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, in prayer and supplications with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. See what he tried to eliminate for you having an effective prayer life? You don't have an effective prayer life when your heart's all troubled up and fearful. Get rid of this ang anxious heart, this troubled, anxious heart that is in fright for flight. Now watch this. And, and what's, he t what's he tell you to do? He tells you to pray. Look at verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer with supplications and thanksgiving. Supplication means having the right, being able, this is a Romans 4.16, this is being able to pull the right doctrine to cor correct the problem you have so that you can apply faith to it. You, listen, your prayer is not, in your troubled heart, your prayer is not getting off the, the ground. Because you don't five John, you don't first John five, fourteen and fifteen. You're not praying according to the will of God. You gotta get this anxious problem in you. You gotta get it resolved by the word of God. You've got to bring it out into the will of God. The word of God brings you to the will of God, and the will of God brings you to the work of God. The word to the will to the work. Now you got now he says, I want you to pray. I want you to pray. Listen. And, and listen, here, and here's what happens. 
Here's what happens to the anxious, troubled, fearful heart. And the peace of God, which surpasses all knowledge, or in this case, all comprehension, shall guard your heart. Whoa! Let not your hearts be troubled. It will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Now, what, let me show you something. Are you with me? Or you go like, oh, he's so deep, he's so this, he's so that. You shut, shut it down, huh? Have you disciple of Jesus? Have you shut it down like the disciples sitting around the Last Supper? My goodness. Let's go to Romans, if you're still with me. Let's go to Romans. Let's go to Romans. Let's take a look at Romans, the eighth chapter. Look, look at verse 26. Go, look, you can't get 28 until you go through 26, 27. You know, anybody knows if you're counting 25, 26, 27, 28. Now, everybody loves 28. But see, you need 26, 27. In the same way, the Spirit, Holy Spirit, also helps our weaknesses, infirmities, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Holy, but the Holy Spirit himself, you always pay attention to himself, God himself, Jesus himself, the Holy Spirit himself. This shows a very key role of responsibility. The Holy Spirit himself intercedes for to which groaning too deep for words and he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is see God's got all that he's trying to work his plan through your life in Christ through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to get it working out on the front line you see that the Spirit is, because He intercedes, that's the second time we've had that, He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. See, that's what He's doing. Then we get verse 28. Then we get verse 28. Okay? Anyhow, that's very important. It's very important. The peace of God is offered to every fallen member of the human race on the basis of faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord's message to Israel through Bethlehem, when they said to the shepherds, For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The angelic choir sang that day a special, a special hymn for the birth of Jesus Christ to the Bethlehem Temple shepherds in Luke 2.14. Glory, glory in excelsis Deo. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he's well pleased. You know who that is? God gave his peace to Jesus Jesus gives it to those who believe that he died for their sins, was buried, and raised from the dead third day. That is what the choir sang. That was the hymn looking to the church age of the new covenant. Romans 1, 6, 1, 16. Uh, Well, look, I've ran out of time. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. I want you to know today, if you're here, you've got a troubled, fearful heart. You're an anxious person by nature. Listen, that's the nature of man. There are a lot of you like that. Shouldn't be in the church, though, a lot of them. They should be in the church trying to get help and relief. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe in Christ. 
Don't let your hearts become fearful. Why do you do this to yourself? There's a cure. That we're still working on a vaccine on this virus, COVID-19. We're still working on it. Listen, this deal was done 2,000 years ago. The virus, the virus was completed 2,000 years ago when Christ died on that cross, was buried and raised from the dead. That deal is over. Listen, who in their right mind who had a virus that was going to kill them, which you have in Adam's sin, and had an absolute curing vaccine would not take that vaccine? Who in their right mind wouldn't do that? That's what I'm asking you today. Because that deal is done. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The peace of God was given to the Son. The Son gives it to everybody who believes. And the Holy Spirit brings it to the reality of your everyday life. In Jesus' name. Believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift. Not of works. It's a grace gift. Believe it. And for those of you that and have been born again, why are you walking around anxious in all of this mess? You have the vaccine already in you. The vaccine is already in you. Work, walk it out by faith instead of getting all panicky and all wound up. This is the message we have to the rest of the world. We've got the vaccine. We've had it for 2,000 years, and it's free. It's by grace. Not that it wasn't great cost, but it's free. Our Father, we thank you today for those who came our way to study with us. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God, and the Word of God would sink deep and become fruitful in their life by the principle of the peace of Christ. Live in the peace of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.